Welcome to Three Books with Neil Pasricha, where each chapter we uncover and discuss the three most formative books of an inspiring individual. We believe books change lives, and that's why we are the only podcast in the world by and for book lovers, writers, makers, sellers, and librarians. Thanks so much for joining us. a personal shopper? I don't, but the idea of the profession, personal shopper, totally fascinates me. I mean, imagine you had somebody who you just said, oh, I need a new shirt, or I kind of need some special shoes, and they just know you. They know how you walk. They know how you dress. They know where you go. They know everything about you. So when they go to the store, they pick it out. It's the right size. It's the right look. It sort of just pushes you into, um, I guess, just a larger, fuller version of yourself, but you don't got to do the shopping work. I guess it fascinates me because, A, I can't, well, I don't have a personal shopper. I don't know if I can or can't. I don't know what the price range of those things are cost. But um, I like the idea of somebody sort of very specifically curating things for me, curating things for me. And while I don't have a personal shopper, I like to think that I have many personal booksellers. I'm talking about people who, when I go in the bookstore and I see someone like Sarah, who is my guest on this episode, um, she's like, oh, how did you like, you know, Everything Matters by Ron Curry Jr.? And I'm like, oh, yeah, thanks for remembering you recommended that to me and also for giving me the guilt trip if I did not read it. So I did read it and I loved it. She's like, oh, well, if you like that, he's got a new book, but I'm not sure if you'd like it. You might want to try, you know, A Fraction of the Whole or have you read all of Jonathan Franz and stuff? And like suddenly I've got a specific human who knows my reading tastes enough that they're recommending stuff to me. On this show, we always say that humans are the best algorithm. I hate the Amazon recommendation engine. It just recommends the same 25 books to me over and over. I don't want the computer telling me what to read. I don't believe in it. I want a person who knows me, who knows what I'm going through, who knows about my divorce, my struggles, my personal issues, who knows everything in my life. And then when I say that was too hard for me, or I wasn't really sure I could get through that, they get me and they push me into a brand new book that helps expand my my mind. A reader lives a thousand lives before he dies. The man who never reads lives only one. Uh, And you are about to hear my incredible conversation with Sarah Ramsey, who I think of as really my favorite bookseller in the world uh, thus far. So options open for anyone else to take the mantle. She works in Book City, an incredible a book chain that's been in Toronto for something like 30 years. And she runs the store in the Bloor West Village neighborhood. For those that are Torontonians or who visit Toronto, you can pop into the Bloor West Village store and Sarah will probably be there. We went all over the place in this conversation. Her first book was my first ever formative book that was a a children's or young adult book. So that's going to be exciting to talk about. And she told me something about this book that I was really surprised at, about how it was edited and changed over the years. So see if you pick up on those little sort of subtle changes. I'll give you a tip off. It's a Judy Bloom book, but I don't want to reveal too much. But I didn't realize that people changed the text of books over the years really at all. Um, So that's a really fascinating conversation. She picked a, a memoir that completely blew my mind and I guess the reasons why she picked the memoir and what that memoir says about beauty and how we look at ourselves in the world was were really fascinating to me. So I'm excited for you to hear about that. And then the uh, third book um, was a bit of a mind blower. I can't say I loved it, but you will hear Sarah vouch for it in a really sweet way that I think will make you very intrigued, especially if you're in a certain stage in your life um, where you might want a book like that. Now, speaking of first, this was also the first chapter of three books that I recorded live in a bookstore while it was open. So we like nestled in by the kids section at the back, like literally crouched over like a desk with a computer on it in the store. And you'll hear funny noises in the back, like a phone ringing sometimes, maybe a customer walking by. That's because we're in Book City. We're in the actual store. And it was a real pleasure to do this with Sarah. She Uh, told me she was nervous, but I guarantee I was more nervous than her and she did an amazing job. Please enjoy my conversation with Sarah Ramsey, my favorite bookseller in the world at the Book City in 
Blur West Village in Toronto. And we think of every chapter of three books as a conversation with three friends. You're one of those friends, which is why we record every chapter of this show in a special two-year format. You'll hear me in one channel, the guest in the other, and we picture you hanging out on the couch between us, enjoying this wild ride we're all on together. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Neil. How are you? Good, thanks. Uh, did you just hear that rolly chair? I... I uh... I just kind of pushed back. You're as getting I said, comfortable. <laughs> I'm getting comfortable because here we are sitting inside my bookstore. Bl- your your bookstore. <laughs> yeah. So tell us tell us where we are, what we're looking at, so people who are listening can sort of picture it. Okay. So we are in Book City in Bloor West Village, um, in Toronto, Canada. We're comfortably ensconced in the children's area right now, um, which I think might be one of my favorite parts of the store. Um, Book City has a wonderful relationship with this neighborhood. We had previously been located two doors down for more than 20 years, um, but another big bookstore moved into the neighborhood and unfortunately really posed a lot of challenges, not only to us, but a couple of other indie bookstores in the neighborhood. When they left um, four years ago, almost four years ago, we moved back in because the neighborhood needs a bookstore. So you were there for 20 years. Yes. And then you- Not me personally. No, no, but, but, but yes. the bookstore. And the then, bookstore existed. But I didn't hear about the, the sort of, the bookstore left. Yes. What, what do you mean left? Yes. Like closed it shop? closed shop. Okay. It wasn't able to compete at the time. Yes. With the big the bookstore big book down store the street. And, and everyone's ordering <laughs> online and stuff too. And so all that's happening. Yes. And then and then suddenly this became a book desert all of a sudden. All of a sudden. And you guys yes. made the, not many people do that. So the, you guys came back. We have a little chutzpah. So <laughs> You're back. But again, the neighborhood really, really needs a bookstore. Yeah, I'll say. So. I mean, I don't even live in this neighborhood and I uh-huh. come, I trek out here because of this bookstore being so yes. good. And so Book City has been around as a chain in Toronto for forever. It's one of the oldest chains in the 42 city. 42 years 42 this year. 42 yes. years. <laughs> and, you know, this bookstore is, it's a small store, right? Like it's like, I want to say two or 3,000 square feet maybe. Yeah, it's really tiny. Right? We're the baby Book City. You're the baby Book City. And yes. then, but all the walls down all the left and all the right are just lined kind of floor to ceiling with the famous like bright yellow yellow signage, and numbered categories, like number 18, middle readers, number 19, mid- older readers, number 21, you know, parenting. Like, what are the numbers? What are all those numbers for? It just help us helps us assign sections, and it helps us mm. measure metrics geographically. Mm. Um, so we can keep track of, you know, how each section is performing. So That's fantastic. Cool. I, yeah. I love that we're recording. This is the first episode <laughs> or chapter of three books that I'm recording in a bookstore that is that is open. So while we're while we're talking, someone's going to come up in the middle of ask you or me for a book recommendations. Quite or potentially, gonna, yes, yes, and that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. So, um, and then you and me, I thought we could just talk. So uh, we met at Tatsapalooza. We did meet at Tatsapalooza. That was two years ago. I, was two, I think more than was that. I think. Well, I think it was 2015. Maybe. Yeah, because that's when Awesome is Everywhere came out. That's right. Right? And, yes. And so I was there schlock, schlepping my, my uh, <laughs> children's book. Yes. And Tots of Palooza is this incredible event where they invite into like a downtown Toronto like concert venue. Yes. Toddlers to mm-hmm. yell and scream at, at authors and, and get their musicians. book signed. And musicians. And make it feel like books are the celebration, which is beautiful. Yeah. Which is kind of like what Word on the Street sort of feels like to me. Yes. The largest uh, open public book festival in Canada. Yeah. Um, and that is just like people just feeling excited and pumped about books. Uh-huh. So, so often the books are like insular. You know, you're kind of like by yourself in this process. The writing of them, the reading of them, all that stuff. So Tots of Palooza, Word yes. on the Street, these festivals yes. are huge. I've yes. never been to any of the like gigantic world book festivals, but I'd love to go. No, me you too. You hear about like Sydney and you hear about, I think it's Jaipur. Yeah. And there's these big ones that yeah. must be so fun. So fun. And and then us, so we developed a connection there. And mm-hmm. then and then I came in here one day and it was and you were here. And I don't think I pieced it together yet, but I was like, <laughs> hey, because I wonder if you somebody can recommend some fiction. And you're like, yeah, I can. And I was like, you're like, what do you like? And I was like, oh, I like a, f- a fraction of the whole by uh-huh. Steve Toltz. Uh-huh. Which no one I know has even heard of, right? It was, but I read it and loved it. You read so. it and loved it, and so it was like Im- immediately I'm like, oh my god! And then I, you're like, what else? And then you suggested a book. You suggested I think Everything Matters. Oh, by, the, by Ron, Ron Curry, Curry Jr. Jr. And I said to you, I've read it and loved it. 
So this was amazing. It's like finding someone who just had this, you know, had this thing and you could put your finger on something. I couldn't even put, put a finger on for myself, which is like mm-hmm. what kind of books I like. Mm-hmm. And so I, I keep coming in here to share context for everyone listening. It's like I come in here probably, I don't know, at least four times a year and I leave with 10 new books, all of which you have given me. You probably give me 40 and then I like try to read the first few pages and, and come up and it's like, how do you do that? How do you come up with like, yeah, you are a lot better than any sort of algorithm or any sort of, you know, what do you do? How but do you, I think how do you, you have sell to acknowledge like that? that it kind of is an algorithm, but on a more personal kind of level. Sometimes, you know, when you're engaging with someone, you ask them, what have you read that you really, really loved? Because maybe they're looking for something kind of similar. Maybe they're too afraid to be a little experimental with what they read. But I think the difference between myself and an actual algorithm is that there's a lot more nuance and subtlety when you're actually talking to a person. You don't clearly just look at their their purchase history. You can sort of understand a little bit more when you're talking to someone face-to-face about what they might be interested in reading, what they might need to read mm. at the time. Uh, is, is there? It seems like part of what you do for me, I know I feel this anyway, is you help me grow. Oh, thank you. Well, like That's you, a huge compliment. Yeah, you do. Because I, I walk out with books that are ch- more challenging. And uh-huh. I don't necessarily mean like vocabulary-wise. I mean uh-huh. like thematically or uh-huh. just an area that I, I'm like, I have never thought about. Like you recommended The Sympathizer. Yes. Which I, I read and loved. And uh-huh. I like knew nothing about um, – the Vietnamese refugee perspective of the Vietnamese of, of the Vietnam War in, mm-hmm. in the U.S. and like I feel like I learned a history lesson. I feel like I learned like a, I lived a totally different life. I, it was uh-huh. incredible, and like I I would never have known I needed to read that book, but you uh-huh. put your finger on it. Well, for thank me. you. <laughs> yeah. So you're great. You're my favorite oh, bookseller in the entire you. world. I come here. <laughs> I come in here specifically because I'm like you. Just point me in these great directions, and so I'm so appreciative of oh. you. You. And and I'm so excited to explore your three most formative books. My three most formative books. Well, I have to tell you, yeah. before we start, yeah. it was really hard to just choose three. Mm-hmm, I can imagine. <laughs> How'd you do that? Um, well, I sort of took a look. I stared at my bookshelves at home for a very long time and tried to figure out maybe at different stages of my life, which piece of fiction or nonfiction was really important to me at the time and sort of was not only formative in the person that I am now, but it was also transformative. It opened me to new ideas. It opened me to maybe new styles of writing. Um, But yeah, I stared at my bookshelf for a long time trying to figure out. Well, I so appreciate you doing that work. And maybe we should also, before we get into the books, like do like a little 30 second on you. Oh, geez. You know, and, and uh, you know, obviously the, the intro was there, but, uh-huh. but you know, um, you're, uh, myself in a nutshell. Yeah. Is that can what you you're can, asking yeah, me? Yeah. So, th- so the people listening can okay. kind of picture you a little bit more. I see lots of piercings. <laughs> Some tattoos. <laughs> Some piercings, tattoos, thick black glasses. Um, Bit of a nerd. I always loved reading. I think, um, my first crush was on Dickens Sowerby from A Secret Garden when I was young. Clearly did not quite understand that he was a fictional character, but I was madly in love with him. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know him. You've never read A Secret Garden? Is, is that the same as The Secret Garden? Yes. But it's funny because I was in that play playing the clarinet in like uh-huh. grade 12, but how do nice. I not know that character? Oh, is it a smaller character? No. He was so formative to the character of Mary in that book. Who's oh yeah? Who's Dickens? Um, pardon me. That, who's Dick, Dickens? Dickens. He yeah. was. He was the. Um, so Mary, the yeah. the major character in the Secret Garden, um, goes to she gets abolished to her to her family who live in the countryside, and Dickens Sowerby happens to be, um, I believe, one of the children of the Help that works there, and she forms this like really beautiful like friendship with him. And I just, oh man, I thought he was the bee's knees. <laughs> okay. The bee's knees. I like that. So your kids, books have been yes, a huge part of your identity. Books have been a huge part and, of my And today you live in Toronto. Life. I do. Family life. Yes. I'm married mm-hmm. to another bookworm. Um, <laughs> As book people usually do. They find each other. When we got together, uh-huh. oh, 
like the merging of that library was epic. <laughs> and you actually did perform a merger. Oh, we did. Okay, yeah. Yeah, there wasn't a lot merged. of um, there wasn't a whole lot of overlap too, which is great because he reads very differently than I do. Um, he's more accepting of technology as well too, and. Um, at one point, he bought himself an e-reader because he really likes to read big books. And you know, they're very hard to carry around with you all the time. But he hid it from me because he didn't want to offend me in any way that he had something electronic to do his reading from, which is not the way that I like to read. But you know what? I find that offensive. I'm glad he hid it from you. <laughs> I don't like e-readers. Well, I don't either. But again, it's a personal choice. Yeah. I wasn't going to shame him for doing it. I obviously understand. <laughs> non judgmental. No, non judgmental. He's still reading. It's not the way that I like to read, but you know. Um, so he hit it. And I believe a few years ago, I was about to take our winter coats in for dry cleaning before the season started. And he had tucked it inside the inside pocket of his winter coat so that I wouldn't find it. But <laughs> just to pull his leg a little bit. Um, he came home from work and I was like, listen, there's something we need to talk about. <laughs> I pulled out this e reader and I'm like, what is this? Like, um, I had discovered like lipstick on his collar or something. And he's like, oh, oh, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, listen, I don't care. This is fine. <laughs> that is so funny. When you, when you say hit it for me, I thought you meant like for a week or two, but you're talking no, like it was probably like- a month or two. He was very nervous. He's like, I never want to devalue what you do as a bookseller. So I'm not going to get an e-reader. I'm not going to get an e-reader. I'm not going to get an e-reader. But he did. And it's fine. We're cool. It's funny how, see, the root of that is I don't want to devalue what you do as a bookseller. Uh -huh. And you're the first bookseller I've uh -huh. had on on the show. Mm -hmm. What What is a bookseller? Well, <laughs> I don't know. I think it's someone ultimately that is really passionate about books that wants to share that passion with other people. Sure, it's capitalist. Sure, it's, you know, all of these other things. But I think ultimately, like a really good bookseller really wants to share their passion for books with with other people. And yeah. I especially like doing it with kids. Because if you can get a kid interested in reading when they're very young, you've mm -hmm. made a reader for life. Mm -hmm. And that's what I really love about working with small print. That's why it's so nice that we're ensconced yeah. yes. in the children's section. In the section, children's section. Which is a huge section. It's got to be it's a thousand of the 3,000 square feet or something. Yes, as well, as at least. Yeah. Ah, cool. All right. So – um, thank oh. you for giving us that color and context. I've got your three books sitting in front of me. Oh, dear. <laughs> and I'm excited to talk about them. So your first cool. book, here uh -huh. we go, is Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret by Judy Bloom. first published in 1970 by Bradbury Press. It's about a sixth grade girl who's grown up without religious affiliation due to her parents' interfaith marriage. The novel explores her quest for a single religion. Margaret also confronts typical issues faced by early adolescent girls going through puberty, such as buying her first bra, having her first period, and feeling attracted to certain boys. The novel has been frequently challenged since the 1980s due to its frank discussions of sexual and religious topics. It's even ranked number 60 on the American Library Association's uh, most like ban like requested banned. to be banned yes. books. Despite that, Judy Bloom's books have sold over 82 million copies in 32 languages. So are you there, goddess me, Margaret? Mm -hmm. Tell us about your relationship with this book. Um, sorry that I have the new <laughs> sorry that I have the new cover. You almost don't want to touch the, it, do you? The you new cover is so great, though. I really, really enjoy it. It's also it also happens to be done by a friend of mine. If you haven't seen the new cover, it's just a text message, obviously from Margaret. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. Then the next little bubble at the bottom is maybe God's actually answering her. It's the three Somebody dots. Is. It's the it's three. It's so the three great. classic like iPhone dots. Like yes. someone's typing. Yes, that's so funny that you like that because I really don't like this cover. I love it. I'm like this book's written in 1970, 50 years ago. Well, and there's now they been have a million co covers. Yeah, but they have this cover as like texting. I love it though. Oh, you do? Okay, you think it's like <clears throat> contemporary. Well, I also think that the themes and the story of Margaret transcend every generation. Like I have four or five copies of this book at home. And um, I actually have a framed dust jacket from the original 
book that was published in 1970 hanging up on my wall. It's like one of my most prized possessions. I love it so much. It's so nostalgic for me. Um, I actually borrowed this book from the library. How old were you? Um, 10, maybe. Um, it was a real treat for us to go to the library where I grew up in southwestern Ontario. And we only had one library. So we made a trip at least every two weeks into town to go to the library. And I had heard about this book. Um, I think some of my classmates had been talking about this book. And I was really afraid to buy a copy of this book. It was definitely a thing that I hid under my pillow from my parents. I didn't want to talk about the themes in this book. They were all things that I was sort of going through at the time. And it was the first book that I hid (laughs) just because of the subject matter. Yeah. It, It wasn't something that I was comfortable bringing up with my family so which part having, which parts are you talking mostly about? the puberty parts mm-hmm, mm-hmm. sometimes the religion parts mm-hmm. but knowing that I had a friend in Margaret made I think that transition during those few years like really easy and I still read it actually like almost every year wow yeah and I sometimes wonder too I know I think a lot of readers out there have always sort of like wondered about Margaret Simon as a young woman and as an older woman because, like, I would be really fascinated to know what she's doing now, <laughs> I think, as an adult. That's amazing because, you know – I you, feel like I grew yeah. up with her. I mean, I, yeah. like, the book was published before I was and born. And there's no sequels or anything to this There book, were no right? sequels yeah. whatsoever. Unlike her other – like, many of her books Unlike, do have sequels, right? Yeah. Tales of, I read Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing yes, when I was a kid. carry through the whole series. Yeah, the Super Fudge and yeah. Fudge Mania and all of that yeah. stuff. And I love those books. Yeah. Uh, I never – I had never read this until uh-huh. now. Uh-huh. And the character, Margaret, is wrestling – Yes. With all these. She's things. exceptionally complex, too. Mm-hmm. I find, um, you know, like I'm also a big fan of the Beverly Cleary books, like the Beezus and Ramona series. Mm-hmm. I really love them, but I found them maybe a little less nuanced. Like Margaret really had, you know, a complex. So, say more about that. What was complex? Relationship with her grandmother. Well, I think grandmother her was relationship with her grandmother. Was who, wants her, who wants her to be Jewish. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, I think her relationship with her best friend was very complex too. Because? Because it was so competitive. Yeah. Um, Nancy Wheeler, I think if we were to categorize her That's the now. Best friend. Mean girl. She was a mean girl. Mm. I think she was absolutely a mean <laughs> girl. And, you know, I, I think what was most touching to me and is still most touching to me is this complex relationship that margaret has with god yeah and i really loved that yeah and 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 for those that haven't read the book in the book you know at the end of many of the chapters there's sort of this italics thought bubble yes um of her asking god to clarify for her what should i do Uh you know my my uh uh father's family is Jewish. My mother's family is is not, but that we yeah. aren't in touch with them anymore. I'm trying to find my own way. Uh-huh. What should I do? Can you give me a sign? Like there's these kind of like open-ended little passages yes. that close the chapters and they're beautiful. And I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Because I don't think that a lot of people's relationships with God or whomever they choose to have faith in, um, like there's not really room for that conversation. And I think it's very black and white. And because I think in a lot of it, cases. Oh, it's interesting. And, and, you know, because it's a YA book, I guess, and because there's humor in this book, it's like, because I need to know if I'm going to go to the YMCA or the Jewish Community Center when I grow up. That's the difference for her. (laughs) Where do I go? So it's like a complex conversation, but it's, it's netting out and just kind of like which community club you go to. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just thought it was lovely and I am still convinced that I would be her friend. Oh, that is so beautiful. If we knew each other. And it says for age 8 to 12 uh-huh. on the back. So you were 10, right? In the yeah, middle. I think so. And then you liked it so much that you, how do you, how does one person obtain an original dust jacket signed? Um, 
I think that there are, I don't even recall where I got it. Is it like an it, eBay thing? It might be, but there's also like a couple of really great websites um, that devote um, all of their energy to finding rare out of print and secondhand books from sellers around the world. Like I didn't need the book. I just wanted the dust jacket because I have so many fond memories of like that first edition. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What did so. it shape or change? I mean, you talked about when you read it and what uh-huh. it did for you and how many times you read it since uh-huh. any so when you hit it from your parents it was uh, under the pillow it was which presumably they never looked yeah under the pillow not no yeah but and then so. and then now when you look back uh-huh what what how did it shape you <laughs> well i just think that it gave me a little bit of quiet strength to navigate all of those things that were happening for me at that time i mean margaret complains about ble- being a late bloomer and gosh I could relate to that. And, you know, feeling competitive with your friends was also extremely relatable at that time. Um, Like I grew up Catholic and um, I had always sort of questioned if there were like other other things out there. And sure, I lost my faith in God a lot of the times. And like my prayers, I guess, were sort of the same as Margaret's at that age. It's like, please let me grow up already. I just really want to grow up. And, you know, being grown up at that point was like, you know, getting your first bra and having your first period. And, you know, it wasn't so, it was a more tangible Mm -hmm. sort of, um, milestone than like being confirmed at church and all of a sudden at 13 you're like a Mm grown-up i love that phrase quiet confidence quiet strength quiet strength you know that's that's really beautiful that's an amazing gift that the book gave you yeah and 50 years ago right in 1970 the book came out i'm actually staring above your head right now at a whole series (laughs) of judy bloom books right on the wall there um who do you think's doing that today like if you if a 10 year old came in uh, a, a girl, you know, you saw in her eyes or through uh-huh. her questions that she's leaning or looking for a book uh-huh. like this. Uh huh. I would still probably recommend that book. Really? Eh? I it's mean, there have been subtle strength. changes yeah. and subtle edits over the year because they've had to kind of like update it, especially when talking about, um, you know, just like sanitary hygiene. They had to update the book. So what changed? Um, well, <laughs> no, you, since my you, mom explains to me you, that. Since you read, read the book, you read the book every year and you have yes. five copies. I'm so yes. curious now. I yes. didn't know this. So this book yes. has changed. The, the language has changed. The language what's, has what's, changed. Tell me what specifically has changed, well, if, you, if you know. Specifically what has changed is um, just like the technology and like sanitary hygiene. Like um, when the book was first written, I have no experience of this, but my mom tells me and the book tells me as well that like when you were menstruating, your pad in your underpants was affixed by this little belt that you had to wear around your waist. So obviously like that changed a lot as the technology of hygiene products changed too. So those have been updated in like the later editions. Interesting. Anything else like that? I'm so curious. This is just, I'm just fascinated like <laughs> well they're changing the book right but, but yeah. i mean they're changing details of it obviously right. like the fundamental story mm-hmm. still exists but i think that's really like the only thing that's so interesting that has though. changed yeah because nobody can relate to the um maxi yeah. pad belt these days yeah i can't <laughs> <laughs> no ditto um Cool. That's so great. What a legacy, yeah. uh, you know, by J- Judy Bloom, who yeah. is – I looked it up. She's around 80 today yes. and, and, and is still publishing. And she's still writing, right? Yes, she, which is fascinating She wrote like a, an older – not not for young adults, but like an old yeah. – like a, her fourth – I think her most recent book yes. was her fourth ever book written for an older For audience. grown-ups, mm-hmm. yes. Yes. But it contains a teenage protagonist. So there is crossover appeal, I think, mm-hmm. like to maybe an older reader – an older young adult reader. Yeah. So and yeah. it's cool that you'd still uh, recommend these books today. It's not oh, like totally. you, it's not like you've shifted to like more totally. contemporary authors. It's like yeah. go back to Judy Bloom. It works. It, yeah, it's great. it totally works. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Oh, ah, yeah. thank you. <laughs> That's great. That's a great conversation on on Are You There, God? It's me, Margaret. Now, your second book. And I love that you've given us three totally different genres too. So that was a YA book. Mm-hmm. The next book is a memoir. Yes. And it's called Autobiography of a Face. By Lucy Greeley. Um, And just to give listeners a bit of context, it was published originally in 1994 
by Houghton Mifflin. Did I say that right? Yes, you did. Houghton Mifflin. <laughs> um, the book was written when Lucy was 31 years old. And I can, we can look at the back and see that she sadly died at age 39. The publisher's weekly summary is of autobiography of, of a face. Diagnosed at age nine with Ewing sarcoma, a cancer that severely disfigured her face, Greeley lost half her jaw, recovered after two and a half years of chemotherapy and radiation, then underwent plastic surgery over the next 20 years to reconstruct her jaw. This harrowing, lyrical, autobiographical memoir which grew out of an award-winning article published in Harper's in 1993, is a striking meditation on the distorting effects of our culture's preoccupation with beauty. Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm-hmm. Um, this is just a stunning book. Well, what is your relationship with Autobiography of a Face? Um, so there is this terrific feminist magazine. It's called Bust. Um, I started subscribing to it when it was still a zine. So this is like I've Pre-mega. had a re- yes, I've had the I've had a relationship with this wonderful magazine for twenty five years. Wow. I think, and I stumbled. The first thing that I always read in Bust were their book reviews, and they had reviewed this book, and immediately I was like, "This sounds fascinating. I really want to read this." So I picked up a How copy. Old were you? This is like back in nineteen ninety four kind of thing. Well, not quite that. Yeah, maybe. 94, 95, I think. And I went to the bookstore and I picked up this book immediately. And I fell in love with it. I mean, it broke my heart in many, many, many ways because it really challenged um, ideas of beauty for me. And um, like, I just thought that it was astonishing. Her prose is astonishing. The writing... Um, was it just so heartfelt and so confrontational at the same time. Like mm-hmm. she really kind of dismantled traditional ideas of beauty and, you know, s- quiet strength. And um, she talks a lot about her sexuality um, in it and feeling sometimes like she's a monster and she's a novelty and that's why people are maybe attracted to her mm. and like it was very formative for me at it's that point a like I was paragraph on when she says that's when I realized I would never have a boyfriend in my entire life yeah. or have sex my entire life it's that was heartbreaking it was like so heartbreaking and you know it's interesting cuz you look mm. at her author photo and i mean she hated being called disfigured this is something that i read about her um it wasn't a disfigurement, but like, I can't really tell from her author author photo that she was as ugly as she described. Like, I think she really fundamentally considered herself a monster. And it makes me really sad that she isolated herself for all of those reasons. Um, she had very few close friendships. One of them is actually the writer, Anne Patchett, who wrote about it in this beautiful book called On Truth and Beauty. Um, which you might be interested in reading. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I mean, it just, I mean, it was alternately like so raw and so honest, but yet really funny and touching and bittersweet sometimes. And, you know, it's interesting to note too that, um, you know, as she was battling uh, the cancer when she was young, her family never called it what it was. Mm -hmm. They spoke about it in really clear diagnostic kinds of terms, but I don't think any of them could like actually muster Mm -hmm. up the courage to say, well, Lucy had cancer. It sounded like she described them as a kind of like a a kind of a Irish uh, kind of tight lipped. I think so. Lots of kids. She was one of the the youngest. She had a twin. Um, So much going on in the family. Mother, it sounds like battling some some mental illness. I think Uh, so. Father who suffers and, you know, dies in this book of pancreatic cancer. Yeah. It sounded like, you know, there was a lot of challenges. Mm -hmm. And I think that word you used, did you say the word lyrical? Or maybe I read that from the Publishers Weekly. It's it's a great way to describe this book. It's It's hard to read. And the cover Mm -hmm. is haunting. It's this, it's this picture, not of her, I don't believe. I love that cover though. But it's a picture of of a girl with like, it's a black and white photo of messy hair and her hands are coming up to her face, covering her face with like a small, like black garbage bag. You can't see any part of her face. Uh Uh-huh. And and the the title's written in like a crayon, like autobiography of a face by Lucy Greeley. 
and it's um it's a, it's yeah it's i'm so glad you yeah. enjoyed oh, it i loved it i loved it but it was hard it was very it was hard, hard to, to read. read and in the middle it of is. reading it i'm like i'm working on kind of like trying to write a bit of a memoir so i started googling around memoirs mm-hmm. and i stumble on this article mm-hmm. um in the new york times mm-hmm. and it, it's called the problem with memoirs yeah by neil genslinger i don't know if you know this article and it was this really like kind of you know nasty piece uh And it says here, like, I'm just going to read a little paragraph from it. This is the New York Times article, The Problem with Memoirs by Neil Genslinger. A moment of silence, please, for the lost art of shutting up. Sure, the resulting list has authors who would be memoir eligible under the old rules, but they are lost in a sea of people you've never heard of, writing uninterestingly about the unexceptional, apparently not realizing how commonplace their little wrinkle is, or how many other people have already been have already written about it. Uh-huh. Memoirs have been disgorged by virtually everyone who's ever had cancer, been anorexic, battled depression, lost weight, by anyone who's ever taught an underprivileged child, adopted an underprivileged child, or been an underprivileged child by anyone who was raised in the 60s, 70s, or 80s, not to mention the 50s, 40s, or 30s, owned a dog, run a marathon, found a religion, held a job. And he goes on and on and on in this piece. And Uh it's like, I read that and I was like, I'm like, this memoir category is growing. It certainly is. It's really growing fast. Well, from what I understand, you know, people, we, you know, self help might be declining a little yeah. bit, but memoirs growing because we can take these lessons and apply them to our own life. You can't read autobiography of a face, and mm-hmm. I love that the phone's ringing, <laughs> and and uh, and and feel and help but feel luck, lucky. You know, I agree. I mean, I, I think that given that it was published for the first time like twenty four years ago, to me it was also very groundbreaking. How so? Well, she was the. I think she was one of the first ones to talk about all of these themes in this book, like with such honesty and such rawness. I mean, I think up until a point, I think biographies were written, um, you know, about really successful people. And sure, she had found some success in her writing and and what she was doing. But I think that... Comparatively, very, very, very little success. Yes. (laughs) Well, I mean, given that she also died... Um, in 2002. Two, yeah. Yeah. I mean, what she did, um, what she overcame and what, you know, where she found her voice, I think in those very short 39 years, was a huge accomplishment and far more interesting to me to read than like, you know, a, a person that has like the ultimate successes at the top of his career has... Sorry, I used a man there as an example. But I think a lot of biographies had been written up at that point by successful men. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of boring, Mm -hmm. to be perfectly honest. A view from the top of of wherever company I'm running. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And this is how I got there. And, you know. It's interesting because maybe that New York Times piece is talking about – it was written a lot more recently. But it's like how the the category is growing and it seems like everyone's writing one. Well, and I – I don't know if they have to. I take a look at someone who gets like a book deal to write a biography in their 20s. It's like, really? What have you done in those 20 years of your life? And then I feel really old and (laughs) unaccomplished because I'm not sure that I could be able to write something. I'm not sure that anybody would be – because, again, the market's oversaturated. How do you distinguish your voice from other people's and your experiences from other people's? And I think like – Her story was so unique and so wonderful and it was so beautifully told that it stands out for me from other books in the category. Yeah. Who would you recommend this book for? Um, Well, I've recommended it to lots of different kinds of people. Um, I've I've recommended it to um, customers that come in that want to read um, a book about – cancer survivors specifically. Um, I've recommended it to customers that have disclosed to me that they, you know, are suffering from very low self-esteem and might have some issues surrounding, you know, the relationship with their body. Um, I've recommended it to people who are grieving because in a lot of ways, it's a book about grief, I think, too. Um, whether or not it's it's a conscious kind of grief, I think a, she and her family spent a lot of time 
grieving her because of her cancer diagnosis. And I'm sure they were all stealing themselves for what they probably figured was inevitable, which could have been her death as a young person. Um, but yeah, I think ultimately it's about like quiet resilience. Mm -hmm. It's about like radical acceptance of who you are. And for me at that age, at, you know, 20 and 21, that idea was like so transformative to me. Like it really spoke to, you know, how I was feeling at the time. It kind of bridges from the feelings that I had when I was reading Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. Here I was like a nervous 10, 11, 12-year-old, a late bloomer. And then when I'm 20, you know, I'm starting to navigate, you know, my first relationships. I'm navigating my sexuality. I'm navigating my relationship with my own body. And that's why it was so transformative to me because at the time, and I still think that it's quite radical, like mm -hmm. this overall acceptance she had of herself, even if it was to say, I'm a monster, I'm never going to be worthy of love. Totally. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm so glad I asked you. It's good for you. You are so articulate at describe <laughs> articulate describing who books are perfect for. Should have you on every single oh, episode geez. talking about that for each book. Um, I feel like it's good for also people who who really liked Wonder. I agree. By R. J. Palacio. Yes. Am I saying that name right? Yes. You know, because that's a that's a YA book. It's yeah. fiction. Yeah. About about disfigurement. Yes. Uh, I know. To sorry to use that that word. You know yeah. about about that perception of beauty and so on. And now here, mm -hmm. this is a autobiography of you know, or memoir that way. So it's yeah. for people that are growing or really like wonder, I feel like that yes. might be a good next book. Yes. Maybe. I, I sometimes always wonder too, like what she could have accomplished had she not died mm -hmm. as well. Like I think there were so many more stories mm -hmm. left for her so to tell. So sad. Age 39. It's and, so and, sad. And it's from a uh, heroin overdose. Yes. Um, Unfortunately, she had become dependent on painkillers given mm -hmm. how many surgeries she'd had through her lifetime. And I guess there's still some speculation there as to whether the overdose was accidental or not, which is really sad. Yeah. And I read a piece written by her sister yes. uh, in The Guardian mm -hmm. where she is saying, uh, it's obviously, an, she says, an accidental heroin overdose. I read something else about, a, you know, addiction to sort of the Oxycontin, that type yeah. of thing. And um, in the essay by her sister in The Guardian, did you read that? Yeah, I did. And she was really challenging um, the book you just mentioned. Yeah, The On Truth and Beauty. Sort of claiming and taking over the grief and publishing it for, yeah. away from the family. And I don't yeah. know if you had a reflection on that. We'll, we'll link in the show notes for this episode to all yeah. these articles, <laughs> like the memoir article, the New York Times, the uh -huh. this Guardian article. So no, we can, you can, smart. if you're interested and you want to go deep into what happened here and, yeah. and the view, like we can, we'll yeah. link to all those articles. So, so my thoughts on, can you on, take, go, can you take someone's grief from them? That's what well, it sounded like it was, she was complaining about in the, uh, I mean, article. I, I think ultimately like she, Lucy had a very different relationship with Ann Patchett than she did her family. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that, I mean, I know from personal experience that I'm probably willing to tell my friends m more yeah. than I might be able to, you know, tell my family. And like Lucy and Anne had a beautiful friendship and it was, it was really non-judgmental in a lot of ways. And I think, I mean, ultimately, I think the person that benefited from the friendship more was Anne. <laughs> Um, she got to write this beautiful book. I think it offered her insight. She talks a lot in the book about, you know, Lucy forcing her to challenge her own ideas about beauty and, you know, the kinds of relationships that we want to have in our life. And I mean, yeah, I think that Lucy's family ultimately was very guarded. I think they probably didn't want to have their laundry aired. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a, that's a not that's an understandable feeling. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it was very contentious. Yeah. Um, they really did not like the publication of On Truth and Beauty, but I think it's an outstanding book, and it offers it sold really, like another sold really point well. yeah. of view mm -hmm. to the autobiography of a face. And maybe that's what all books are doing, right? Like they just keep adding to this global conversation we're having about. I think so. About views yeah. of yeah. this tiny short life we all have for sure so. 
Yeah. Ah, but it's so understandable to to understand the perspective. <laughs> I don't want yeah. my my you know sister yeah. who's dead to yeah. have a whole book written about her that has mentions her in all these ways that we didn't of necessarily course. know about her. So that's you know, totally, there's also yeah. honoring mm-hmm. you know a person's memory and keeping what's sacred to other parties maybe sacred as well. Yeah, it's so yeah. hard. I um, they weren't shared experiences, so I think maybe that's where some of the conflict comes in too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a hard, it's a hard, big thing to yeah. think about. I, uh, in my TED talk, uh-huh. um, I talk about my friend, Chris, who, mm-hmm. um, took his own life mm-hmm. and I have had people say to me, Hey, that was exploitive. Uh-huh. Um, you know, your friend took his own life. What right do you have to sort of use that? But in he your was also speech? part of your narrative, right? I know he was. And I did talk to, I of course spoke to his family, um, before I did that speech and, uh-huh. and used his picture, but I, it, it strikes me in my stomach when I hear those conversations because you know you never when you have a friend that you lose and you want to you want to share that story and honor them and somehow. On, the word yeah. honor is a great beautiful yeah. word right as yeah. opposed to sort of yeah you know using yeah. Lucy Greeley's story to sell a book yeah. that doesn't sound pro- right and I don't think yeah. that's what happened. I mean by no means it's it, yeah. it, is it a book uh, like a bestseller here like yeah. I really try to like suss someone out before I. I don't think it's a book for everybody. I mean, I think it's a book for everybody, but I don't think it's a book face. for everybody. Yeah. 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 Not truth. Yeah. I need to really sort of ask quietly if, you know, they'd be interested in reading something like that or maybe they're in the right space or. I'm so glad you know. we have it on our on our list now. So <laughs> that's the second book. The third book. Uh-huh. Can, we, can we transition up to the third book? Of course. Book? The third book. And we have a customer <laughs> here. Do you want to ask? Do we have any? Do you have questions? You're okay. Okay, we have because okay. Exactly okay, okay, great. great. <laughs> we love when customers know exactly what they're looking for. <clears throat> so, uh, the third book is uh-huh. called Light Boxes. Yes, a novel by Shane Jones. Yes, originally published by Publishing Genius in 2009, and then uh-huh. eventually released by uh, Penguin yes. in 2010. Yes. It is the surrealist first novel by poet. Shane Jones. Mm-hmm. Um, the description I have is that it was originally like a limited edition of, I guess, with publishing genius of a thousand copies. And the description I have is that it's a unique novel of seasonal affective disorder come to life uh, in spare prose that could almost be considered poetry. It's the story of a town ravaged by endless winter and endless February. Mm-hmm. It's been February for several hundred days. But February isn't only a relentless month. It's also the malevolent being holding the town sort of hostage, stealing yes. children and, yes. you know, just like devastating the community. This yes. is a rotating narrator book, uh-huh. like the Babysitter's Club. Yes. Like every page is like told by a different perspective. <laughs> yes. It's super fast paced, totally uh-huh. mind blowing and crazy. Like it's so hard to. Anyway, it it's is. It's very hard to categorize. It's hard to categorize. <laughs> Tell us about your relationship with light boxes. Originally, I picked it up because I like the cover. I'm not even going to lie. <laughs> cover, I think is it a, is, is, a, is a, a stunner. Yeah. It's a drawing of five tall men wearing black top hats, wearing bird these masks. bird masks. Yes. And they are characters in the book called I, the Solution, are they yes. called? Yes. And their legs are all tied together with ropes. It's yes. so confusing. Like, you have no idea what that cover means. It is, it is it. It, strange and beautiful and... I love it so much. Again, I literally just picked it up because the cover fascinated me. I knew nothing you can judge a book about by him. Its cover. I absolutely think you can judge a book by its cover, and there's no shame in doing that no. either. I think, like especially given, um, you know, these days when people are really actively curating their libraries, um, there's nothing wrong with having a lot of beautiful books on your shelf mm-hmm. just because they're beautiful. Yeah. I mean, obviously, they should be read too, but and not treated like objects. But I, I have lots of beautiful books it's, on my shelf. I have eleven different copies of Candide. I'm never going to read. So, what is that book? Candide by Voltaire. Ah. Yeah, they're all beautiful editions. I will probably never read them all, but I love them, and so. Yeah. And you have five. You've already said you had five copies of five copies are, of Are You, are you, are you There, God, it's me, Margaret. Margaret. <laughs> you know, I stole an idea from somebody when we 
created a built-in bookshelf near our front door. I, mm-hmm. I go on and on in this article I wrote about how it's important to have a bookshelf near your front door uh-huh. and no television in sight because uh-huh. it'll just force your behavior to be reading more uh-huh. rather than watching TV. And so in the bookshelf that we put in, mm-hmm. we built it so that it's like like the bookstore. We're surrounded by like lots of tall walls. And then in the corner, we did a display case. Not Smart. with glass on the front, but just like a corner yeah. display. And I bought the little book stands. Like, nice. you know, I, I found them. And then I display uh-huh. the fronts of books that are provoking my thinking at different times. Smart. So I, I'm right now showing Brave Enough by uh-huh. Cheryl Strait to uh-huh. remind me to be brave in my writing. I'm showing On Mortality by mm-hmm. Christopher Hitchens. Just mm-hmm. remind me, you know, Memento Mori, just to remind me of death and just sort of be... So I like the idea of judging books by their cover. I yes. agree with you that they provoke and prompt different emotions to yes. bubble up. So you picked it up by its cover. I picked and, it and, up by its cover. And then what happened? And then my mind was blown. Um, and it's only because it is – it's structured in a way that was, like, really unfamiliar to me. I don't read a lot of experimental fiction. I don't think I'm smart enough to read a lot of experimental fiction. Um, but just – the way the story was told and the images, like I was very much in my head in this book. Like the way that it's written, it's like a modern day fable, the way that he describes things. Like I could almost taste mm-hmm. some of the descriptions. One of, of the things. blurbs even says this book is almost edible. No, it truly is. Yeah. Um, I had heard that. Um, the director, Spike Jones, had gotten uh, his hands on one of the first limited edition copies of this book and had been interested in filming it. And I'm almost kind of glad that that didn't happen because I really like the pictures that I have in my head of this story. Like, it's just... It's it's kind of where the wild things are type feel. A little bit. Yeah. And I'm so fascinated by all of the characters in it. And I'm so interested in like the idea of being plunged into this this never ending february and i love all of the townspeople in this book they all have aspirations to fly um and one of the things that um this malevolent god february does is he takes away all of those things so he's robbing them of all of their ambitions and ultimately all of their joy and it's it's just so it's so fascinating. I love the way he writes. The things that he's written since have been just as ethereal and wonderful. And I think he's the coolest. Wow. So. <laughs> you know how you said I don't feel like I'm smart enough for experimental fiction. I like don't. I had that I had that feeling inside myself the entire time I was reading this book. I'm like <laughs> I feel lost. I feel dumb. I feel like I can't follow. Like a, a character uh-huh. would be introduced, and I couldn't. So uh-huh. you got. I'm so like you got something from this. Uh-huh. It's a formative book for you, and uh-huh. I I was I was puzzled by it. Well, it just it kind of for me opened up like so much possibility in that things didn't have to adhere to like a specific mm-hmm. form or structure. Not even, it's not even linear. It was wildly imaginative. Like I said, it was ethereal. I, I think that there were, you know, a lot of instances where I was just carried away by the description of things. Like I said, I was very much in yeah. my head when I was reading it. And I'm so glad that it wasn't actually made into a film because and then it would rob me of like all of these experiences that, that I had. I mean, it would be great to, you know, see someone else's, you know, view of this story. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, like I treasure this. It gets into your heart. So much yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that it would almost be spoiled, I think. Uh, who would you recommend this book for? Um, I kind of recommend it to um, people who like quirky thoughtful things. I have recommended it to people that have read Everything Matters. Um, I've recommended it to people who have read books like um, Her Body and Other Parties by Carmen Machado. Um, I've read it to readers of Fever Dream by Samantha Schweblin. Um, I've read it to people that I've kind of decided maybe – They'd be willing to go out on a limb and experience something kind of new, but by no means is it like a bestseller here. I think people sort of like flip through it and they see the structure and they're like, yeah. 
even just <laughs> it, yeah, it's it's a hard it's a hard book. It's a little the font size is going up and down, which is kind of cool. Like the whispers get smaller yeah. and the screams are really big. Yeah. It's just yeah. beautiful how he did that. Yeah, but it's uh such a different. Book. Yeah, it's it's yeah. it's so radically different than yeah. I think anything else on my shelf. But like I said, I got really excited about the possibility that someone could be out there writing these magical, marvelous, kind of strange and quirky little books. Well, the interesting thing you mentioned is people would pick it up. They'd flip through it. They'd sort of be like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if this could, could yeah. do it for me. And, you know, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but whenever you give me a pile of books here, I think you do uh-huh. know this, I always say I'm going to do the first five pages yes. test. Yes. So I always read the first five pages because I'm trying to assess, do I like the pace of the book? Mm-hmm. Can I read this type of writing? Is yeah. it too advanced for me or uh-huh. whatever? Can I? Can, am I – does the style work for me? Is it so, and so yeah. within the first five pages, if it doesn't grab me, I put it back. Uh-huh. Now, because I read like uh-huh. boxes for this conversation uh-huh. and I read Autobiography of Face, both uh-huh. of those took way longer than five pages for me to kind of get sucked in. So I'm I'm actually second guessing myself now on my Uh-oh. test. Uh-oh. But ha- that's what I want to ask you about. I want to ask you about patience. Uh-huh. I want to ask you about patience with a book. Uh-huh. Life is short. We Life don't have is that short. Much time. Yes. How do you – figure out when to give a book, like when you're like, how many pages, how do you figure out when you chuck a book, when to keep going? What is it about a book that helps you decide whether you're going to read it all the way or not? Well, I mean, generally, I like to tell people, um, like, life is too short to be reading a book that you're not enjoying. Totally. But, We're all pro-quitting here, yeah, for sure. <laughs> of course. Yeah. But um, I generally, like I like to acknowledge that sometimes I'm not in the right headspace and sometimes I don't have the quiet time and attention to give a book that I think it ultimately deserves. So I'm actually, I don't heed my own advice at all. I will keep books on my shelf. And when I decide that I'm ready to read them and like really give the book the time and intention that it deserves. I will go back to it. There's not a book that I have never not finished on my shelf. Wait a minute. There's never, there's no book on your shelf that you haven't finished. No. Really? So your shelf is just books you finished. Yes. And if you haven't finished them, what you sell I mean, them? I do have a totally out of control to be read pile that doesn't count. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's- Every book that I have on my shelf has been read. And loved or just read? Um, I haven't loved them all. Yeah. And, but the ones but you don't love, you don't get rid of. It depends. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to get to that in the yes. fast money round. Because oh, <laughs> the reason I was asking is because on my bookshelf, I only have two kinds of books. Mm-hmm. I have books I've loved uh-huh. and books I haven't read. Uh-huh. Anything in between that spectrum. It doesn't exist. Doesn't on, exist on my bookshelf. It goes out. It's not it allowed goes, to. It goes to the lending library. Yes. It goes to the, yes. the used bookstore. Right? Uh-huh. It goes to a friend who comes uh-huh. to visit. Uh-huh. I just only want the books to be books I've loved. Like yes. I love it so much, I want to stare at it for the rest of my yes. life. Yes. Or I haven't read it yet. Uh-huh. Those are the only two books I have on my bookshelf. But anyway, uh-huh. um, I mean, I do like an awful lot of books. <laughs> the there are very few that I, you know, am totally devoted to and completely love. I know the You're- three that I mentioned to you, though, are. On the love, these three, <laughs> yes. I know, and they're all very, very interesting, special, uh-huh. formative books, and I hadn't yes. read. Any of them, so I'm so there glad I did. Yay. <laughs> um, can we do a little fast money round now as we've of course. talked about these three books? Of course. Okay. So here it is. Uh-huh. Uh, this is kind of related to exactly what we're talking about. How do you organize your books? Just how if I look at your bookshelf at home, what's the organization? Genre. <laughs> kind of like this bookstore. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> like, do you even have the like, young readers, six to nine, middle readers, nine to twelve? No, I don't have plus. enough kids' books to to okay. to to micromanage them like that. Yeah. Um, the biggest selection of books that I have at home are cookbooks and books on food writing. Um, so those are separated from the books that I, they used to cook with and the books that could alternately take their place on my shelf or by my bedside table that are really great books about food. Fantastic. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, now the next question, I don't want to include this bookstore because this bookstore is very special to both of us already. Of but what is outside of Book City, uh, the store that you run, is what is your favorite bookstore and why? So it could be anywhere in the world or anything like that. Wow. Um, I make a point of every time I travel to visit bookstores, it annoys my husband to no end because – I could just spend hours and hours and hours in other books. Tell him to go read an e-reader in the park. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I actually really, really, really love City Lights in San Francisco. 
Um, just because it's where Lawrence Ferlinghetti is, and he was very is much. Um, uh, he's a publisher. Um, he was um, really uh, responsible for bringing about a lot of American beat literature. Oh. He was the first one to publish Kerouac. Okay, got it. And um, this was his bookstore. This is his bookstore. Like he he opened this bookstore. Yes. Oh, interesting. And it's fantastic. So it's been around a while. It's been around for a long, long, uh-huh. long time. I believe that he's in his nineties now, and he's still writing and publishing. And he's still in the bookstore. Occasionally. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful bookstore. It carries a lot of um, the stuff that I'm really interested in reading, like quirky, wonderful fiction. Um, they carry a lot of um, debut authors and self-published authors. And the space is really gorgeous, like three floors. It's very much a community hub. It's very much like a home for um, – activism in San Francisco. And it is really, really terrific. I um, spent a lot of time in there when I was in San Francisco. And like, I just felt like I could have dropped dead on the floor and everything would have been right with wow, my life. Wow, so. that's such a good feeling. <laughs> I am so ashamed to say I have not been there. I've been a number of indie oh, bookstores fantastic. in San Francisco, but yeah, I will, I'm will. i going to have to go there. I'm yeah. excited to go now. Um, what is your white whale book or any book that you have wanted to read for such a long time and just never have or have been, or as Elan Mastai said, um, the book that's conquered you, which for him was Ulysses by the way. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it beat him. Ulysses conquered him. Yeah, that's a tough book. But what, yeah, yeah. I, was like, I was like, what are you, are you kidding me? Like, yeah. I haven't tried. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Not so sure I want to. So I think maybe it would be Don Quixote. Don Quixote. Yeah. yeah I so think so. If you wanted to read it? I think so. Maybe some of the Russians too. Um, but yeah, I think Don Quixote. I think would be. What is it about it? That's uh... the length. I'm not going to lie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it is a big book. It is very dense, but the story is so interesting to me. Um, I, you know, I also really wonder about books in translation too. I wish I could speak more languages. I'm really only primarily an English speaker, but I sometimes wonder about what gets lost in a book's translation and what might be added to a book's translation. I just actually recently found out um, there's a really terrific um, Korean author named Han Kang. She wrote this book called The Vegetarian, um, and it was translated, and the translator actually added, didn't like the way the story was going, and added their own stuff to the narrative. So now I'm curious about what the what the book was that the author actually wrote. Wow. And you think about like a Murakami or someone yeah. like that who's so, does so well in yeah. English, but he writes in Japanese, yes. right? Like, so you're like, there's got to be some translator in the middle translating every Murakami book that's like doing such a good job because uh-huh. the writing is beautiful in these translations, or at least I find it so. You don't. But is it the translations that are beautiful yeah. or the original? I know, you're making. Like it. I know. I don't mean to make you neurotic about your books and well, translation. Well, I, I, I guess I have to learn Japanese <laughs> to really know. But yeah, you I'm make so a, curious. You make a great point. I mean, I have. What if the book is like ben's, badly translated? So the book, and of, you just blow it off because the translation is so terrible. So the book of awesome mm-hmm. is uh, is doing really well in Asia, mm-hmm. in in China, mm-hmm. and in Japan, and mm-hmm. those markets have bought the sequels and stuff uh-huh. whereas in germany uh-huh. which had like a good advance for my first book the book of awesome it like was a du- it was like a huge flop it was a huge flop and i gave it the mm-hmm. german copy which is called um fantastique the book nice. of the book of fantastique um <laughs> i gave it to my german next door neighbor uh-huh. and i said hey can you read this uh-huh. and then can you tell me what you think and you uh-huh. know what she said to me? Uh-huh. She's like, I didn't like it at all. I liked it way better in English. And I was like, well, why? She's like, I don't know. Something about it. You you sounded, in the German version, you sounded like um, too jokey. 
and to really? yeah, it was this weird thing, and I was like, oh, I wish I could read it and understand the books and trailers. So it's the some, translation. Well, who knows? Maybe. No, pff, maybe I'm just saying that because uh-huh. it didn't do well. It just and bombed in Germany. Think about it. Now I'm like, yeah, yeah, exactly. and also like, who's the Chinese? Uh-huh. Who, who's the Chinese translator that I need to like? Whose feet I need to kiss because yes. it's doing well there? You know what yeah. I mean? And so that's the part. You're right. It's uh-huh. so interesting. Mm-hmm. Ah, and yeah. it's not like music. Like music, I've heard like for example, Sloan. Mm-hmm. You know. Uh, Canadian rock band yes. it does really well in uh, Japan. I believe yes. I read that, but they're not translating the music. The music's the music. Yes, right. So music doesn't get translated. No, but books do. Uh huh. So I, I, you're anyway. There's a whole yes. big nut here that I'm so interested <laughs> in, in opening up. I'm gonna have to get a translator. Yes. On three books, and yeah. ask them these questions. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that would be fascinating. And they're so not they're so not well known. Like, yeah. like can you name a translator? Like, I don't know who I would even go to start. There's their names aren't published in the front of the books. I don't think they're in the acknowledgments. Uh-huh. You know, it's I'm gonna it's a mystery. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's all that dirty work behind the scenes. I yeah, guess. I like your suspicion though. That's so that's so <laughs> great. You're like, it wasn't well, even. Well, I'm always very curious about it. Mm-hmm. Like, am I actually reading the author's work or did the translator sort of? Well, plus to your point, if you take a book like, you know, uh, Seneca's, you know, Letters from a Stoic, Uh when you, and I I love that, right? But I love a version of that. Yes. And when you read about it online, people Uh are like, avoid this version, avoid that version, avoid this translation. This translation is really good. So people have all kinds of views because there's so many translations of it. 2,000 year old, you know, philosophical textbook kind of thing. And not many books now, I don't think, not I can think of, get more than one translation, yeah. right? They get the one they get and that's it. I I have read translations of the Odyssey before and I'm currently reading a new one. And what's really fascinating about it is um, it's the first time it's been translated by a woman. So oh. the emphasis in the story is a lot different. It's not necessarily so much on the male characters that are driving the narrative. It's all the women behind the scenes who really were like cast aside in previous translations. So I think I'm really enjoying it. Could someone say that that is, you know, changing the book? Like was that, sorry, I don't, you know, I, I don't know what Homer Maybe, was intended. Yes. But, yes. but like is, is this a, a version of the Odyssey that is, that is changing I, I, she's the still Odyssey? telling the story, but the emphasis, like it's it's is it driven from, Bu- from another. Was it from, did you find out about from Bust Magazine? I did not. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Although I, they're still my go-to for like really interesting yeah. recommendations. That's so that's so fun. Okay, I'm like speechless because I'm trying to figure this. Out. This is going to be a big knot. Okay, we're oh, going to talk about this more. No, I'm, I'm interested <laughs> in it. Um, and now the final question, the last uh-huh. question, and this has been such a great conversation, uh-huh. is. Um, for anyone who's out there who is in the book selling business mm-hmm. like you are, who is so yeah. good at it like you are, you are my favorite bookseller in the world. Like I come here and you just connect me to these books I never would even would know to. What are your one or two pieces of wisdom? How do you do the thing you do so well? Oh dear. Um well. I think the biggest piece of advice I would have to give someone is just just really listen. I find we don't listen a whole lot. Like I was explaining to you earlier, it's 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 very it's very subtle and it's very nuanced when you're talking to someone about their books. I find that a lot of people come in here and they feel a lot of shame because they like to read from a particular genre and people haven't like valued that kind of genre. I used to work in a bookstore that separated its literature from its fiction. And ultimately what that meant is that the fiction was there to be mass consumed and it was typically in a mass market format, whereas the literature was in a trade paperback. And I think that made a lot of readers feel really isolated and kind of shamed. I'm in the dumb section. (laughs) Me too, I think. But like, no one should ever say to you, well, here's a guilty pleasure for you to read. Mm. You should never feel guilty about what you want to read. If you enjoyed mysteries, which is not really my jam, you know, have at it. Not everybody enjoys like the food writing that I'm trying to, you know, really talk about a lot of times. And if you find something that you 
you know, are not really into, know when to keep trying with it and know when to just say, yeah, this really wasn't my my thing. But I think ultimately listening is the most important thing to do when you have a job like this. Eliminating book shame, eliminating book guilt, beautiful values that we espouse at Three Books. Thank you so much, Sarah, (laughs) for this conversation. You're welcome. Thank you. (laughs) Hey, everybody. It is Jess Neal again. Sarah Ramsey. Sarah Ramsey, my personal bookseller. You know what's funny when I say that? Because people have, you got someone cutting your hair, don't you? You've got a hair salonist or a barber. You go to the same dude, right? Like you go to the same lady, you go to the same person because they know you. They have, they know your hair, they know your preferences. When you go there next time, you're like, I want to try something different. I want to kind of grow it out a bit. That relationship is really special for people. If you've ever felt when you go to like a barbershop or a hair salon and like they're like, you know, uh, Aldo doesn't work here anymore. Or like, you know, sorry, but Joanna's moved on. How do you feel? You're distraught, right? Your heart is like ache. You're like, oh no, does anybody know where they went? Like I gotta find them. And it's like a, it's like a mystery to find this person. That relationship you have with the person who does your hair, I think everybody needs a similar relationship with a bookseller. I think everybody needs to have a person that they have a store, have a person that knows their tastes, that as Sarah said, expands their thinking, that helps them lean into the emotion that they're grappling with. Are they going through loss and grief and would uh, or beauty issues? And would Autobiography of a Face be a great book? Sarah will help you. And it's not just Sarah, it's the Sarahs of the world. And I think, you know, I, I got to be honest with you guys, when I got into books, and and as you know, or, or as you, or maybe I have shared with you, it was pretty recent. Like I loved books as a kid. I fell out of them. I started writing books. And in episode one of three books, you hear my wife, Leslie, say, I found it so weird when we started dating, how you didn't even read. Well, I got into books more recently, and the word bookseller to me didn't have any meaning. Like it would be the equivalent of saying like, um sort of like a cashier. And I'm not saying, I'm not trying to say that to um, disempower the word cashier because there are fantastic cashiers. And I actually have a relationship with two cashiers around the corner of my house. I just mean like it was a word that described a task as opposed to a word that described a relationship. And now as I've deepened my love of books, as we continue this conversation, what I'm recognizing and what I'm trying to really espouse is that we need to have a deep relationship, an emotional relationship with someone who knows our reading tastes. I'm really hoping that you have a Sarah in your life or you can develop a a relationship with a Sarah in your life. And if you live in Toronto, that's Sarah that could be the actual Sarah at the Book City in Bloor West Village. Um, But I also hope, and this is a really big part of, of the show, that three bucks can be a bit of a bookseller to you. I hope that in an era of infinite choice, you know, one of our values is that the value of curation skyrockets, right? The value of curation skyrockets. So this the show, is, uh, is what I'm doing as I try to read these books, hopefully can be a bit of a selection tool to help you find your next book that changes your life. Three books will hopefully find the next book for you that changes your life. And now, if you've made it this far, I'd like to welcome you into the end of the podcast club. This is the club for people who are hardcore. You know, you are listening all the way to the end of the podcast, whether you are driving a truck or working out in the gym or taking your dog for a walk on the beaches of San Diego or wherever you are. I always mention San Diego a lot, I know. Um, This is for you. This is a little extra taster, a little extra treat at the end of the podcast. Now, we do a few things at the end of the podcast club, and the first thing we do is take one of your phone calls. Remember, you can call me anytime. I am at one eight three three read a lot. I'm at one eight three three read a lot. Call me anytime. Leave me a short voicemail with your name, where you're from, and your question or comment. So let's go to the phones. Neil, a man. This is uh, Tim calling from South Bend, Indiana. Uh, just listened to your podcast with Seth Godin. Loved it. And uh, as a father of three small little people, um, I think you're missing an opportunity to get some good children's books on the podcast. Two of my favorite uh, ones are The Little Blue Truck and The Blue Lobster. Both have good 
messages for kids, also for adults as well. I've learned a few things from uh, from both of those. So I uh, hope you're doing well. Keep up the good work. Listen to you soon. Thank you, Tim, from South Bend, Indiana. I loved your your call and your, your comment. You're right. Um, we do need more kids books on the show. I guess, I guess Sarah talking about, are you there, God? It's me, Margaret, veers us a little younger. And I will also hint that the guest for chapter five, um, I'll just tell you, I'll just tell you, I'll tell you who the guest is. It's Gretchen Rubin, author of The Happiness Project. And she has a children's book in her selection, but you're right. I mean, if we're talking about forming books, if we're talking about what books formed you, then children's books are a really big part of it because you were this, you know, nebulous jumble of organs and blood just floating around until you got sort of coagulated. And what helps coagulate you? Things like children's books. They help teach morals and values and ethics and principles. And I think that's a really good point. And we will strive as best as we can to have more children's books on the show. So thank you very much for your call. And now we are going to do the review of the chapter. Remember, every chapter of the show, we go on iTunes, we skim them, we find a review. And we pick a review that's just funny or interesting or critical or whatever, and we read it. And whoever is the author of the review that we read gets a free signed book of their choice. They just have to email us and tell us. So this chapter's review, here we go, I'm pulling it up right now, is from Robin Q. Okay. The subject line is thankful you are honest. Five stars. I just listened to your latest three books. Uh, Good stuff. I love to read and I feel naked if I don't have one or two or three on the go. One place I read on a regular basis is the elliptical machine. They actually have little, very little plastic pieces so I can keep my book open, but they are not well designed for book lovers who have many different shapes and sizes of books. Many people comment they don't know how I read while I'm moving, but they seem to do the same thing with the little screens they have um, watching cooking shows or the news. It's true. It's true. We, we, we book lovers are toting books around, aren't we? No, wait. The review continues, and there is constructive feedback in here. I'm going to read it for you. I like the three books format, and I'm thankful you interview people because it helps me understand others better. One comment, here's the constructive part, one comment is you shouldn't speak over others or interrupt them, which you did twice on the podcast with Frank Warren, because I can't hear either of you. Besides that, congratulations, it was a great idea for a podcast, and I'm loving it. Thank you, Robin Q, R-O-B-Y-N, and the letter Q, thank you, Robin Q, and it's a good point, I have to be careful, I don't talk over people, Um, I'm learning, and one of the reasons I do 100% of these episodes, these chapters in person is because I'm really striving to read people's physical cues, verbal cues, nonverbal cues, and do my best to um, give them the space to articulate their thoughts while also provoking their thoughts. So I'm learning and I appreciate your patience as I get better. Okay, what is next? Okay, here's something I want to add to the end of the podcast club. Tell me if you guys like it or not. It's called the word of the chapter. So I pick out a word that I did not understand at the time my guest said it, and then I define it in the close. So this chapter's word is chutzpah. Chutzpah, that's spelt C-H-U-T-Z, or Z, if you prefer, P-A-H. Again, that's C-H-U-T-Z or Z, P-A-H, pronounced chutzpah. The definition is audacity or impudence. Synonyms are nerve, boldness, guts, temerity, and the sample given online is hilarious. The sample is, it took a lot of chutzpah for her to walk in on Owen's bachelor party. (laughs) That's the funniest example I've ever heard. And so, as we close up here, another chapter of three books, chapter four with Sarah, who, who just broadened our minds, I think, so much and really helped us shed so much of the guilt and shame that we often all feel. It's nice of her to talk about that, the e-reader story with her husband. I'm still laughing about. I just want to say a big thank you. You know, whether you're going online to threebooks.co and checking out the show notes, signing up for our mailing list, or you're following us online at Neil Pasricha on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or wherever you like to hang out, I really appreciate the love and the energy that we are getting on this 
show. You know, it's new. It's bootstrapped. There are no ads. Um, we're doing it all ourselves, and we're doing it because we love books. And already, you guys have helped this show crack the top 100 of all podcasts in the world on iTunes. Um, I screenshotted it a few times and have tweeted it and shared that, which is just so special because we're not doing this show to be popular. We're not. You know, this is not a show that's going to be popular. Most people don't read. Okay, let's just start there. But, but the fact that it's resonating with our beautiful community of book lovers, writers, makers, sellers, and librarians is meaning so much. We are only on chapter four. We have 333 chapters total for 1,000 formative books. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for listening. And until the next full moon, I remain your humble servant, Neil Pasricha. And remember, until next time, you are what you eat and you are what you read. Talk to you soon.